Hey, what's up everybody? Wow, what a long, like, time it's been. This is another video on the search for answers. I highly recommend you watch this one. It's primarily completely bench testing, like literally the whole thing. So I recommend you watching it. There's only gonna be a little bit of discussion right now about what we're gonna be, think we're gonna be seeing and what we're gonna be observing. But in general, this is a lot of bench, test, bench testing. So today is 1.23.18, it's currently 11 a.m. And basically what I wanna to bring to your attention is how a magnet interacts with a coil. Okay, these are diagrams I'm gonna show you. All right, I wanna show you what I've got as far as a construction of the probes. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you this one for now. So this is a very small wire, all right? It's a number 45 or a 46, and it's wrapped on the outside of a Teflon tube um, cover. Okay, so that's one of our probes. Another one of our probes is literally a piece of that wire, if you can even see it. It is literally right in front of my hand. I'm moving the wire, not my hand. See it? So that is also the same gauge wire, okay? The last homemade probe that we're using, gotta get it off here, it's the same wire, but wrapped on the end of a pencil, or a pen tube, I should say. Okay, so it's also just a small probe, all right? So the idea behind these, okay, is to take different, where did I put that thing? Oh, here it is, is to take different aspects of sizes and shapes. Well, these are all round, I guess. But the other wire is just a wire. And we're gonna pass a magnet, okay? Um, I have here, well, right now one, but I have two stacked together. But one of these is a three quarter inch round by three quarter inch long uh, in 52 magnet. All right, so let me show you the test platform that we're gonna be using. And then um, for each test, actually I'm gonna describe something first. Then for each test, we're gonna guess what we're gonna see, then we're gonna look at what the bench tells us. Um, once we get out through all that, we're actually gonna be looking at this monstrous coil that's sitting right next to me and its ginormous magnet and those interactions, because those are very important. But first, I am gonna start you off with Joseph Newman's theory of what a magnetic field looks like. I'm gonna go through this in just one minute, really briefly. Now, what Joseph Newman gave us was a mechanical field theory, okay? So he says that these little things are gyroscopic particles and they're flowing in one direction and the other direction. They're actually going in both directions at the same time. But their spins are different. So these are all spinning in, these are all spinning out, depending on which side of the magnet. This is north, this is south. And actually, if you look, okay, so these are shells of, of flux lines, basically. And they're like toruses, right? They're actually shells around the material. And remember what I told you in the last video, I told you that each one of these particles is still attached to the inner workings of the material inside of this substance, whatever it's made out of. And I will not go into that in this video, but do watch my previous videos on this and I, I talk about that. So if you look here, right, if these are gyroscopic particles, they interact with each other as such, as gyroscopic particles would interact, or gyroscopes. So if we look here, okay, north and north, you can see how they're, the particles are spinning. Their direction of spin, right, are in the same direction, which means they cannot mesh as gears, which means they push each other away. Just like those, remember those old games where you spun the little things on the board and they went around and they hit each other? I never played that as a kid, but I really liked it because it was destructive. And uh, that's the same interaction right here. Okay, so if you put a north and a south together, they attract, right? Well, look at the interaction. Those mesh like gears, and those flux lines literally get meshed together, all right? And form, uh, you know, possibly another whole nother flux line field there. I, I, I can't go into that right now. But the point is, is the interaction between the magnetic field of induced current, okay, is one of these is an induced field in that coil, Right, and one of them is the magnetic field. Now you can't take this diagram and call it a coil because that doesn't quite work that way because we're talking about induction currents.
So it's a bit different. We're only, we're only going to be looking at voltage today. Okay, we're going to be looking at traces on the oscilloscope and the voltage induced. We're not going to worry about current. All we care about is depending on if the current is going in one direction or the other direction, the voltage is on the top of the zero line or the bottom. That's very simple, okay? If the voltage is above, it's going one direction. If the voltage is going down, right? If it's going up, it's induced in one direction. If it's going down, it's induced in a different direction. Easy. But this is how the field interacts, and you can get these out of Newman's book, okay? And what he actually says, right? If you look here, if you were to pass a wire, just like this, okay? cross a face of a magnet, in this case south, across the face, then as the magnet, or as the, as the wire is moving, okay, in, in, this, in a certain direction, the induced voltage, or current, I should say, is going in one direction, here it's going in the other direction, and here it's going in the other direction. One, two, three. There are three interactions with this edge of the magnet. Okay, and if you turn it, then you get a different result, okay? You get a different result of interaction between the wires going this way. And these are simple observations, very basic experiments, but very unintuitive. Because what do we want in an electrical generator? Most of the time we want current to go in one direction, right? We want the highest amplitude with the most amount of current. That's not always true, but I'm just saying in general speaking, that's what we want. So now we're going to look at what's obvious, right? And we're going to look at what's unobvious. So we're going to do the whole thing on the bench. Right behind me is the setup. So let's talk about a little bit of what we think we're going to see. And then we'll go into what we actually see. Okay, so yes, I went treasure hunting today and I found this board on the side of the road. Woohoo! Okay, so what we're going to do in this test, alright, is I have a coil like this. And it's facing this way and I have a magnet like this, and we're gonna pass it on the pendulum, okay, back and forth so we can see what this looks like. So let me um, think about what I should see here, okay? I have one pole, so the most obvious, right, the most obvious is that you'd have just one sweep of the action, right, across here, and so you'd only have one thing. Hold on, gotta get the door. So if it were me and I was just sitting here and I didn't do these tests yet, I would suggest, right, I don't like that black one. I would suggest in my head, okay, that if the, if the magnet is going this way, all right, uh, south and north in this case, all right, and I've got my my coil of wire like that, right, can you see that? Oh, that's really bad. I guess I'll use black anyway and just have to scrub it off. Okay, I got you really close uh, because you can't really see much, so I, I tried to redraw that. But basically, I have exactly what I showed you. I got the magnet and the coil just like this. So the question begins, what's the signal going to look like when it passes this way? And what does the signal look like when it swings back? Because you may have two totally different interactions depending on what's going on. So, in my mind, I would expect, because it's just a north, or in this case a south, passing the edge of a coil, right, you'd expect an output something like that. I mean, just logically thinking. Now, if you look right here about this diagram, Newman says you're going to see a completely different interaction. Okay, Newman actually states you're going to see the first cut of the flux right here, then the second cut of the flux, which is actually two times the cutting, right? Because you're cutting this one and that one at the same time or right next to each other, so it's actually more, um, uh, I guess, more flux density, right? And then you're going to come back and you're going to get the other direction. So, same direction, same direction. Okay, that's the same direction here. And then the opposite direction, that's this one here. That's what Newman states you're going to get. My obvious thinking is something similar to this. Now, these are two totally different results, which is why this is very counterintuitive. A pole passing a coil should produce one direction of current, you would think. 
and this is a small coil and it's a little bit smaller than the magnet. So let's look at the real scope shots and see what we actually got. All right, sorry for the semi-poor quality here, but you can see this is exactly what we got, right? We got a peak going up, coming back down, and that's exactly what Newman says. He says you're going to cut the flux going one direction, you're going to cut the flux in the middle, two different sets of it, so it should be twice as much, or back to the center, back out to the other center, uh, past center I mean, and then back towards the edge of the magnet, and that's exactly what you see. Now, here is the interesting observation. It does not matter which direction the magnet goes, it is always the same signal. Now that seems also a bit counterintuitive, but if you look at the diagram, you can understand why that's true depending on the spin, depending on the direction, okay, you actually get that exact result. Okay, so it doesn't matter if this end comes first or this end comes first. Okay, they both are going to cut in the same orientation as what we've shown back there. And then it, in the middle, okay, this is what I was saying, you cut this way until you get to the middle, then you cut again until you get to the end. That's why this goes negative. This second half and this first half are actually two different, uh, where are we at? Two different interactions here. Two completely different interactions. Very counterintuitive, yet exactly what we see on the oscilloscope. All right, before I move on, I want to show you something that I was not very clear about, which is in this video I talk about the direction of which the current is flowing by which these are going. So the zero line is right here. So current is flowing in one direction here, okay, and as it comes back down it's still flowing in the same direction, it goes back up, it's still flowing in the same direction, and it goes back down, okay, and when it reaches the zero line that is when it switches direction. This is going the other direction. Okay? And the reason I need to point that out is because sometimes I talk about the current reversals. So here you'd have one, two, three, four current reversals, but actually this is still current flowing in the same direction because it's on on this side of the circuit. Because we're talking about a coil and induction, we're talking about currents going the same direction even though the voltage is dropping. Because it has to truly be on the other side of the zero line. That's a very important thing that I sort of misspeak about in this video, so I wanted to just make that really clear right now. To further confirm my thoughts to you right now, <clears throat> I have basically done exactly that. I've taken a current probe and a voltage reading and now I'm measuring the current and the voltage at the same time. And you can see anything on this side is considered negative and anything on this side is considered positive. And you can see how they're perfectly in phase with each other. So just note that for the rest of this video because I was not real clear on that and I may have said a few things that weren't quite right. However, when you look at what I'm showing you right now, you'll understand that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. All right, because this is going to take quite some time and I don't want to extend this out too far, I'm going to let you guys stop the video and think about what's going to happen on your own. So if I put the coil this direction, okay, and I pass the magnet like this, okay, across the coil this direction, remember before it was this way, now it's across the side of the coil. This is the more conventional way here and the more unconventional way here, okay? So the question is, is if the magnet is still facing this way and the coil is now sideways, what's the interaction look like? Okay, so think about that on your own for a little bit. Here's the diagram once again. I'll hold it in the right orientation. So think about what the interaction is going to be. All right, and then let's go look at what actually happens. Okay, here we are. This is what the signal looks like. You have a pass going the wrong direction. You have a pass going up to the center and higher yet past the center. 
back down and back down. So how many current reversals do you have? One, two, three, four. And if you read Mr. Newman's book, you will find out he describes this very clearly and tells you exactly what's going on. Now the question is, earlier we noticed that they always went the same direction, no matter what. Okay, up, back down, up, up, back down, up. Or actually it was, uh, yeah, up, down, back up. So what happens in this scenario? Is it the same direction or the other direction? So here's your answer. And look at that. They actually go opposite directions, okay, because the induced current into the wire is now not the same as it was previously. So um, this is what we just looked at. Now here's the addition of the other portion you can see up here. Okay. But get that. Depending on the direction of the magnet, one way or the other, we get a totally different result when the coil is at 90 degrees from the magnet and swept across it long ways like I showed you. Again, this is all a bit counterintuitive, to me anyway. And so these are things that you really need to study. If you want to completely understand how this stuff works, you must study the interaction between these things. Okay, and for simplicity's sakes, let's just try it a different orientation. What if I take it and I pass it this way? Okay, so, you know, originally we did it this way. Then we did it long ways. What happens if we pass it this way at 90 degrees with that? Okay, what actually happens? Now, you need to note that there is a wire Okay, running long ways down the side of this, which does have a little bit of interaction between this test. I don't do this test on many other things, I just did it on this one, so I'm going to show you what the result was. But think about what, what the interaction is going to be with it passing this way. So here is the result of that test, and you can see there is a little spike, and look at that. These are both in the same direction no matter which way the magnet is swinging back and forth. Now, I'm still not convinced yet if it's that little bitty wire that's actually creating this or if it is truly something else. From my other previous tests, you shouldn't see much of any induction when you pass a magnet at that angle across the wire. However, this was the result I got, so this is the result I'm going to show you. Okay, for this next set of tests, I'm using a Gauss meter, a Gauss meter, however you want to pronounce it, a Tesla meter, okay? This is the um, Bell, oh, FW Bell brand. There's the numbers if you'd like to see them. Um, but this guy, okay, has a probe that looks like this. Now, it is very hard to see, and you might, might even be able to see through there if it would ha happen to focus, which it may not, but right in the tip, that's weird, the light going through there. But right at the tip of this thing is a very sensitive probe, okay? And this is an output channel, and it is going to the oscilloscope. So it's not calibrated to the oscilloscope. It's just so that we can see what the analog signal looks like coming out of this probe. Now, this is measuring the magnetic flux, right? And the magnetic flux density, where the coils that I'm going to show you and how I've got them configured they are measuring the induced current and voltage. Technically, we're just measuring voltage, but depending again on the direction, we can tell which way the current is flowing. Um, we don't know how much, but we don't care right now. We're just wanting to look at the signals and how the magnet interacts. So this is picking up the flux density, which is important to note, okay? And the other ones are picking up the induced voltage and direction, okay? So now let me show you what the test setup looks like. All right, so uh, in this test configuration, I just wanted to show you what the bench looks like. I've got the coils here. I've got a swinging magnet here so we can just check left, right, left, right. And then I've also got uh, that all connected to this apparatus. And then I have each channel, the oscilloscope, the first one, which is the yellow. It is connected to the uh, Gauss meter. Uh, the blue channel, which is the second one, is connected to the bigger diameter coil. Uh, the third channel, which is the pink magenta color, is connected to the smaller diameter coil. And then the last channel, the green one, it is connected to the single strand of wire. The wire is uh, 45, 46 AWG by measurement. 
Um, I don't know the exact, but it's in that measurement. So the magnet is facing south down, and the coils are configured in that orientation with the hall sensor. And we are just catching those scope shots as they go by. Stop the magnet so you can see how it's sitting. Okay, so these are the results from that configuration. And as you can see, they are very interesting results. One thing to note here, okay, is the polarity reversal. All of these are different except for channel 1, because channel 1 is measuring the flux density of the north or the south pole. And they just happen to be the same direction, but everything else is the opposite direction. Okay, so these are, again, things you need to just pause the video, think about the configuration of how it was set up, and think about what the scope shots look like. Let me get you a closer shot of that setup. Here's a little bit closer shot there of what it looks like. A little closer. You can see okay, how these dip negative stronger than each other. They're a similar peak, but they dip stronger in the negative current going the wrong direction. And it's hard to tell, but there is a little bitty dip on that single wire green trace as well. So let's go ahead and look at what the next configuration is going to look like so that you can guess what might happen. Okay, now the orientation is as such and the hull probe sensor here is actually just like this so we can get a reading with it. I'll get you a close up of this because you can actually see the, uh, the fine wire on there where before you almost couldn't even see it. Okay, there you can see the uh, really fine wire. It's a really small wire. These are uh, 30 or 45 to 46 AWG by measurement. But you can see how we got that set up. We've got the big coil, the small one, and the hall sensor right in the middle there, holding it by hand. So the results from that test are here. Now, I don't know what all this noise is. I don't know where that came from, but just ignore it. It's just background noise. I believe it's a AC line from somewhere. It's right at 160 uh, uh, peaks. Well, it hurts. Anyway, so this is what one peak looks like according to that configuration. Okay, and you can see, right, how this goes up, down, and up. All right, just like our coils configured in the very beginning, in the very first test, we had the same result. Now, there's a very interesting thing here that I want to point out that is very critical, okay? And we'll look at that on the last slide. Let me go to the next one. So here's two cycles, and as you can see, right, the two main coils are going in the same induced direction on each one of these. However, look at the green wire. The single wire showed a directional change according to which way the magnet was swinging even though it's say it's south facing down okay very counterintuitive a single wire is showing direction of induced current but a coil of wire is showing the same direction depending no, no matter which direction it's going it still reacts the same way it's very interesting and again the hall sensor is going the same direction So this is the same test that we just looked at. This is just a closer view of one of the sweeps of the magnet. Now there's a very critical thing to look out here. One of those coils is bigger than the magnet, and one of those coils is smaller than the magnet, than the surface of the magnet. Okay, so let me get the magnet so I can exactly show you what I mean, because I don't want you confused. Okay, here are the two sensors, right? And if you look at the surface area, that coil's smaller than the surface area of the magnet. This one is bigger than the surface area of the magnet. And it yields different results. This is very important. Okay, this is critical to think, all right, what happens on the interaction of that coil to the size of this magnet? Okay, these diagrams are in Newman's book. You can get them, print them out. I will post on here what page they're on in the book 
and you can look at the interaction. So why is that important? Do you see how this tries to flatline? This is one passing of one side of the coil. This is the other passing of the other side of the coil. You don't get that here because the, the coil and the magnet are interacting as one. Here, they start to, is to, os to isolate themselves, okay? And that is very important, and we'll get to that at the end of this video. So let's look at the next configuration for the next test. And the last configuration here, it's swinging a bit, but uh, just to give you a visual, it's the same orientation. The magnet is turned, the coils are all the same, and the hall sensor is like this. So the coil magnet and everything else is at a 90 degree. So here is a close-up shot, right? This is the magnet at a, at a uh, 90 degree angle, so it's swinging on its side past the coils which are standing up. Now once again, very interesting results. Why is that? Don't forget the yellow trace, and it's kind of hard to see here, but the yellow trace goes down up and back down. This is the exact opposite of what we were seeing when the magnet was facing one direction, but it's the exact same as what the coil was showing when it was flipped the other way. You really need to sit down and look at the tests and look at the results because these are basic fundamental things that Faraday was trying to discover in his time, but he didn't have this kind of equipment to do it. And now we do, and we get to see very clearly the results that are very important to us. So, and also note, okay, what's going on here? The single wire goes up, down, and back up, okay? Again, four current reversals here, three current reversals on the, on the single wire, and the magnetic hall sensor actually shows us three reversals because you gotta remember the magnet is on its side. So we should see that. So this is a very clear indication of which way the coil acts and which way the magnet acts when they interact with each other at different angles. This is the point of the test. So let's look at a, a far away shot and see if these are polarity swapped when the direction goes the other way. And look at that. They are reversed. However, what's interesting to note is the single wire. The single wire is not reversed. The hall sensor goes up, down, then up. Over here it goes down, up, then down. And you can just go ahead and see the other uh, pink slash purple and the uh, turquoise slash green. Oh, I'm sorry, that is the turquoise. And then you can see the green. Look at the green. Up, down, up, up, down, up. So these are in the same direction, right? And everything else is in the opposite direction. Again, very important clues to why these make clear indication of understanding. Let's go ahead and move on to the next orientation of the setup. So this is the current configuration. I've got a big coil, a small coil, the Hall probe sensor, and a single wire all connected into one spot. There you can see the uh, orientation of the magnet. So here is the result of that configuration. So now, look what's happening. The Hall sensor, right, and the induced voltage are acting pretty well the same. See that? And look what happens to the single wire green trace. Let's go ahead and look at a far away shot and see if the polarity flips. And there you go. And here is a closer shot of what's going on there. You can actually see there's a tiny bit of negative or opposite current flow on the purple one. Not so much on the green one though. Again, all these little bitty tiny observations are very crucial to understanding the real interaction between a coil and a magnet. And if you want to do what I'm doing, you're going to need to really understand this stuff. 
I'm presenting it to you in the best way I can without getting so deep that you'll get confused. So what I'm highly recommending is just read Newman's book, cut these diagrams out, put two of them together, see how they interact, then you can understand a little bit more how the coils and the magnets will interact. Come back and watch this video again, stop at every single one of these slides, look at the setup, look at the result, and think really hard. Now it's time to move on to that. Well actually first I'm gonna have this and that. But then we're gonna move on to that. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Oh yeah, this is awesome. Brownies and tea. Mmm, oh that's great. That's really good. All right, well, welcome to the next experiment. So, you know, we did a lot of experimentation, and if magnetization agrees with this type of diagram, which I have a very strong indication this is a very, very accurate way of looking how a magnetic field reacts, then the question is, if I have a stack of magnets like this, okay, these are the same uh, three-quarter inch magnets I just have two stacked together and we have a really big coil like this and we try to interact these as we did with the little coils and the same magnet we just want to find out is it possible to sweep a magnet across the coil without creating any wrong direction of current so remember we're measuring voltage so anytime the voltage is above the zero line, the current is flowing one way. And if the voltage drops below the zero line, the current is flowing the other way. So the idea is to generate a system of magnet inter interactions to the coil where we do not have any wrong direction current. We want current to be going in the same direction at all times when the magnet sweeps past it. <clears throat> all right, so the question is, how can we generate a signal that does not go in the wrong direction? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take the magnets in this orientation, okay, and I'm just going to sweep them past the coil, okay? And if I do a good job, you can see that depending on the direction I go, I get a different reaction. But what's important to see here is that there are one, two, three, four current reversals four of them. Now I'm going to take the same magnet and pass it in the other orientation. And again, if I do a good job here, you'll see that no matter which way I go, as long as I don't flip the magnet over, I get the same reaction. Now what's interesting about this reaction is I have one, two, three current reversals. Okay. So then the question is, is how do I create only one direction current? Well, I'm going to actually show you how to do that. It's very simple. Because of the interaction that happens according to this diagram right here, okay, because of how this magnet is aligned and how the interaction between this side and this side are actually different, so it's different from here to the inside of the magnet, to the outside of the magnet. So one, two, three current reversals. Okay, that's what these, these wires indicate right there. So if you don't bring the end of the magnet past the end of the coil, then we should be able to generate only one direction current. So I'm gonna hold this thing about here and I'm only gonna move, okay, up to about the same spot in the top. So here we go. And there you go. There's current in only one direction. Now if I go past the top, okay, so I went past the top and look what happened. Right, we got current in both directions. Okay, here we go again. Current in both directions. But if I stop before it gets to the end of the coil, 
Look at that. Only one direction. So right now I'm holding the magnet in this orientation. What happens if I turn it in the same direction as the coil? Well, let's try it. Not much of anything, right? Now what happens if I pull it past the top of the coil, starting above the bottom? There we go. Now we got the same reaction. We got a current reversal. And that's because the edge of the magnet is passing the edge of the coil. So what happens if I do this? Look at that. Okay. Same direction as the coil. I know it's pegging off. I need to go a little slower. Okay. It's the same direction. So what happens if I turn the magnet this orientation? Look at that. Now we got four current reversals. What happens if I only move the magnet where the coil is at? Look at that. Only one direction. See that? Only one direction. See? Now if I move it fast, it looks like it looks like one, but it's actually not. Okay? What happens if I lay it sideways and do it? Now, you can see it goes up and down, and I believe part of that is to do to the fact that I'm actually passing the width of the coil here. Okay? So this begs the question. If I can generate, right, only one direction of current, and I'm putting only one direction of current in the coil, I'm inducing one direction, and I'm putting voltage into one direction, and all this combined is turning the magnet to align itself with the magnetic field, and it's all good. It's all going in the same direction. The current going in that's being induced, right, see I went past the edge, is one direction, all right, and the magnet is trying to align. So let me get you a really good close-up here, and I'll show you what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, so you can see the magnet here, right? I'm going to zoom in so you can see it even closer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it at a 45, like this, and I'm going to rotate it only to another 45, okay? And look, our current is only one direction. So if the, if the magnet's like this, and it's trying to align itself like that, then guess what? Right? I know it's hard to see, but it's only going in one direction. Now I'm having a hard time flipping it and not making it rock. But the idea here is that if you can get the coil to align the magnet, okay, and the power being applied is in the same direction as the induction through the magnetic flux into the coil, right, the same direction, then everything is going in the same direction. There is zero cogging, and the magnet is actually aligning itself. And because of the induction currents, if the induction currents from the magnet are big enough, it will actually create a magnetic field in the coil stronger than what the voltage and current is being applied. So everything is constantly working together, and nothing is fighting. So let's get the big magnet out and see if that's still true, because that flux field is much, much, much greater than this little guy. Let's see if that works. All right, so now we have this very large neodymium magnet, and this is actually extremely hard to do. But if you look, okay, the magnet, all right, let's go ahead and look at the magnet. It's approximately, um, I believe it's seven inches. Yeah, it's approximately seven inches. And the coil here is approximately 13. It's actually 12 at the core and 13 a little bit out. So the interaction here, right, if we got 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so we've got 3 inches on each side where the end of the magnet is not passing the end of the coil. And that is very important for getting current to be induced in only one direction in a coil. Now, the thing we have to think about is this field extends into the other side of this coil. So, 
even though this side of the coil is being induced with the magnetic flux from this magnet, this side of the coil is too. And this is actually a very interesting point. So if you put the magnet on the inside of the coil, then the question becomes, does this interaction between both sides, the north and the south, create the proper direction of induced current? And I, I, yeah, I know the answer to that question, and you guys should actually know the answer to that question, but I'll let you think about it. So now I'm going to show you what it looks like on the oscilloscope when we use this very, very big magnet. Uh, the, uh, the division is set to 15 volts, just FYI. So you can already see the dip. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rotate it one half cycle. Okay, there's a little bit of jitter there, but you could see it's only in one direction. See that? Depending on the direction I spin it, the induced voltage never goes the wrong direction. It is always the same direction. And I can continue to spin this thing over and over. And I know it's probably going off scale, but it's just the idea. Okay. Now if I put the scale a little higher here, and I... Oh, I need to put it back on the big divisions. So right now it's on 50 volts per division. Now if I spin this guy, you can see, okay, you can see how it's interacting with the scope, and you can see how it's interacting with the coil. All right, and what I want to point out is this flat spot right here. This flat spot right here is actually the center of the two magnets. So here's a strong pole passing the center of the coil. Here's another strong pole pin passing the center of the coil. And right here is the center of the magnet. Okay, so when the magnet is aligned perpendicularly with the coil, we basically get no induction, which makes perfect logical sense. Now, one thing you got to remember is if the magnetic field is being generated like this, okay, hopefully you can see that all right. If the magnetic field is being generated like that, and here is the magnet, okay, so without getting too deep into, New into Newman's theory, if you look at the way that these two spin, north and north push away from each other because their gears spinning in the same direct, uh, direction, okay, as he uh, likes to describe with gy gyroscopic action, which is actually a great way to do it. So these are actually hitting each other. They're spinning the same direction, so they can't merge. These guys are spinning the same direction into each other, and they will merge, so north and south attract. Okay, North and north oppose each other. So the question be becomes, how do you get the magnets to align this way, right? And actually, if you just look, okay, this one's spinning this way, this one's spinning this way, they should merge. Now if we flip it over, north, north, facing up, you can see they both spin the same direction and they do not merge. So this is the way these are gonna to try to align themselves. North, south, north, south. Now, to prove that point, okay, without getting too close to that big magnet, we're gonna take these two magnets, right? So right now, you know, north and south are attracted to each other. So if I break these apart, right, these, these two, let me see if I got a good shot here. There we go. So these two are attracted to each other, right, as you can tell. So therefore, they should attract each other like that. And look, they do. So north, south, north, south. Okay, that's exactly, that's exactly what we got right here on, these, on this diagram. Okay. So what does that mean for this big giant magnet and this big giant coil? Well, they are going to try to align themselves like this. Now, if the direction of this magnet is going in the right way, right, if it's going up to try to align itself, the induction currents, you know, they're rotating in a different direction. Okay, the, in, the induction currents on the scope, right? Boom. So which way? Oh, it's not running. 
Okay. So if this magnet is spinning from top to bottom, or in this case, uh, clockwise, then the induced currents is going one direction. If it's going counterclockwise, the induced currents are going the other direction. So if you want the magnet to align itself with these flux lines coming out of this coil, then depending on which way this magnet's spinning, you're either going to be fighting your uh, input voltage and current, or you're going to be helping your input voltage and current. So depending on what you want to do, maybe you want to fight it. In my case, I'd imagine you want to be helpful because you want the magnet to align itself and induce voltage and current into the coil in the same direction that voltage and current is already flowing so that this magnet has torque. Right? And literally, if you want to think about it this way, which is almost hard to believe, the magnet is almost, and I say almost, spinning itself through its own induced currents of the magnet. Now that's something to think about. Obviously it won't run itself like that, but I'm just saying, if you want to think of it, you can actually say that the, incurrence, the currents that are being induced in this coil are creating a magnetic field in one direction, and the coil is trying to align itself in that same direction. Therefore, the magnetic field induced is actually trying to align itself. It's, it's practically spinning itself at some RPM or magnetic interaction. I'm not saying that's possible to do it by itself with no input. I'm just trying to show you how this device appears that it should function. All right, for the sake of curiosity, with this magnet sitting, uh, mm, it's about two and a half, two inches, we'll call it two inches away from the coil, the face of the magnet from the face of this coil. With the coil shorted, so all of this is shorted, let's find out how much current, okay? This has uh, 45 or 46.5 kilo ohms of resistance. So what we're gonna do is I've shorted it out, I've put a current probe across the winding of this coil, and I'd like to find out, just spinning it by hand, okay, how much current can I induce into this coil? So according to these calculations on the scope here, it says we've got a minimum of 9.6 and a maximum of 12.8 peak to peak value of 24.4 milliamps. Now I can tell you at 600 volts, this guy pulls around 15 milliamps of current at 600 volts. So technically, if this rotor can spin at that RPM with only 15 milliamps at, that's constant current by the way, it's actually a lot less when you pulse it, then technically the induced current would be more than what you're even putting into the thing. Something to think about. Um, so yeah. Okay, so now I want to show you another interesting interaction, which is what happens when the coil is on top, or the magnet's on top of this coil. Now the magnet is, you know, four inches in diameter, and the coil here is uh, about nine and a half inches in diameter. Okay, so those are something to think about. But it's pretty well right in the middle of this coil. Right now the orientation is aligned with this, right? So you can imagine this is what's happening. Um, whenever the polarity of this is trying to match the polarity of that. So let's go ahead and flip this 180. And look, do you see that? One direction. That had a little, a little hip. One direction. One direction. One direction. One direction. Okay. So as I flip this thing, only 180 degrees, we only get one direction. But there's one very interesting thing to see. So I'm going to spin this faster so we can see the interaction faster. And then I'm going to pause this thing and I will um, show you what I'm trying to show you. So... 
the interaction, okay, you remember from her, or well, um, yeah, I already showed you that. So you remember the earlier interaction was that we had a little flat spot here, and we had a high peak, and then we came back down to a flat spot. So here, this is a much wider with no flat spot. So this swing, right, is, an, is a different interaction from what's going on. And these are just, again, all the little things that you need to just pay attention to and look at and think about because all these little critical points will basically make or break what you're trying to do. And um, it's very critical. You know, in the, in the past experiments, we played with capacitors. Okay, we made our own. That was awesome. We got to see how they react when you take them apart and put them together. We made, you know, a couple coils and capacitor circuits and kind of played with how those react and how to dump energy from a cap to another cap through an inductor and save almost all the energy by, um, by also creating a magnetic field. We did all these simple tests, you know. We used a switch, a relay, and just tapped it. And all these little things are crucial to understanding the global scheme of what you're trying to do. If you don't understand all the aspects of your system and you don't take the time to go through that, then you're not gonna get to where you wanna go. I'm pretty convinced of that through my own experience. So, let me go to the next test. Um, no, actually, that's the end. Let me jump over to the last few bits of what I wanna tell you, and then, uh, yeah, we'll let you go. All right, so there's one last thing I want to include in this video. And it is something for you to think about. Now, out of all these tests, I used coils and I interacted with a magnet and I looked at the induced current and I used the voltage signal as a source of direction of current. Okay, I wasn't concerned how much or anything like that. I just wanted to see the signal. Now, the most critical and important aspect of everything I did here was the example of how a regular solenoid coil generates a magnetic field and how the interaction between a single wire and a magnet works okay so if you look at how a single wire interacts and then you tell yourself but I want to also generate a magnetic field that I can interact with a magnet then if you don't want right if you want to get rid of as much as Lin's Law as you possibly can and you want to induce currents in one direction you only interact with a single wire but yet you need a solenoid to create the magnetic field in the same type of orientation as your magnet so everything's at 90 degree angles so really think about and go back and look at all the data I presented you on the single wire which was the green trace for most of my early testing in this video. It's very important, it's very straightforward, and if you can really think about that, you can understand completely how to, for the most part, completely get rid of Lin's Law altogether. It's very simple. You just have to do it. And in this video, I demonstrated everything you needed to understand to grasp that. But I am gonna make you think about it. You gotta look through this video Think about what I'm presenting here and all the data I shared. Do these experiments yourself. You don't need a fancy piece of equipment. You can get a, you know, $60 pocket oscilloscope and do these tests, right? Grab some small wire. It doesn't have to be that small. You could use bigger wire. Grab any size magnet. And just do the tests. It's super simple, right? I'm just using string, a few magnets, and some, you know, small bits of coil, you know, 10 feet of wire. Um, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right. Let's get to the end of this video. Okay, well, I really hope that you guys are learning something and this is actually interesting because there's a lot of things that we take for granted and it's the simple observations. Most people, they just go straight to the books, right? Grab what they are taught and then apply it, whether it be mathematics, whether it be um, electrical engineering or physics. They just don't even ask questions anymore about the fundamental building blocks of what they're learning. So in this mentality of thinking, we're doing a very simple bench experiment here where we take a magnet and pass it past a coil. We look at the scope shots and we analyze what is going on. Now, as simple as that sounds, right, you'd think that these things would be very obvious, 
But in my opinion, this was very unintuitive. All of this stuff that we learned here is very unintuitive. Okay, now if you think it's obvious, I'm going to read a little quote from the editors of uh, Mr. Newman's book, actually. So this was written by the editor. So, those who understand the essential nature of Mr. Newman's energy machine may claim that it is design that its design is simple and obvious. Of course it is. All great concepts and many major inventions throughout our history are very simple and obvious. But only after they are understood. The wheel is simple and obvious, but nevertheless a very important invention that revolutionized our development as a species. One might ask, why was the wheel not obvious to the countless human beings who lived before the inventor of the wheel? The following quotation from Christian Morgest, Morgestan, I think that's the guy's name, answers this, answers this question quite elegantly. Okay? So the question is, why is the wheel not obvious to the countless human beings who lived before the inventor of the wheel? The obvious is that which is never seen until someone expresses it simply. Okay? So when somebody expresses something simply that is very obvious, then one can actually grasp it. So the idea of making these videos and teaching you about what I've learned is to show you the obvious. But if you don't understand the obvious, you can't use it. And what's interesting is sometimes the obvious is ignored and we just go straight to what we think we know without ever actually doing these type of experiments. So that's all I got for you. This was a pretty long one, but I think it was well worth your time. I hope you made it all the way through it. And if you did, then you should have learned a lot about this guy right here. So read the Bible more. I promise you, whether you're religious, not religious, you don't like reading that type of stuff or you do, you will learn some important key values that I've learned in my life that have gotten me to this point and that will allow me to understand this technology. God bless you guys. Have a good day. Thanks to everyone who has supported me for all this time. One day at a time, we'll get it done. Peace. Bye-bye. Oh, that's a big coil.